Welcome to a breaking news edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 122, and we're going to talk about news that makes George and I blue. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And today is September 23rd, 2014. All right, as you can see by looking at your screens, I'm back from my cruise to Bermuda. Had a great time. Um, I'm a little darker. I'm not that uh, Ivory Coast type person you're used to seeing. And I've been trying to adjust my camera over here to uh, to work with this tan. It'll go away soon. I'm not a, a tanning type person. Um, so George and I have gone through a lot in the last couple of weeks. George has relocated from uh, Vero Beach to Crystal River. Uh, he's went from the east coast of Florida to the west coast. Uh, I went from the uh, Baltimore uh, with my wife on Royal Caribbean to Bermuda for a week. And um, I'm still in this brain fog after vacation. So you'll have to excuse any time I use mispronunciation. I don't speak correct English, so you want to hear it. Um, and George is pretty high on this new church you've been uh, serving. How's that going? Well, we've had three Sundays now, three weekends, and it has been fantastic. We had a really great show out for the first Sunday, and to my excitement and delight, each Sunday we've seen more people. I thought, well, but come see the new guy, then go back home. But we've maintained it, we're growing. And it's exciting. It's an exciting, alive, spiritually dynamic, vibrant place. Mm -hmm. This past Sunday, for instance, and I can get away with stuff here that uh, just, I think, excites people. <laughs> people are shaking their head, oh no. <laughs> and, I mean, this is why nobody else will hire me, for instance. But um, we, our gospel reading this past week was the uh, parable of the two laborers in the vineyard, one who works uh, all day mm -hmm. and one who works only partially. And so to discuss the, theolo the, the theology behind this, uh, I led the congregation in singing the banana boat song. Deo. <laughs> Deo, Deo, daylight come, and you know we have a number of West Indians, and they sort of joined me in the acapella uh, rendition of that, and we sort of, and I, in my sermon, I juxtaposed the lyrics of the banana boat song, "Work all night till the day is done," with the uh, doctrine, with the gospel readings, and then we got into about a fifteen-minute discursus on the doctrine of limbo. Limbo, See, yes. Calypso music, Kevin, can be used for so many theological purposes. Now you learned that in Oxford, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun parish. Now, what I'm going to do next week, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking of Mel Torme somehow. Like, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, that's not bad at all. Now, people are watching go, well, aren't you talking about the breaking news? Yes, it's breaking news. But uh, like true narcissists, we had to talk about ourselves first. Um, the breaking news is Catherine Jeffords Shorey has sent out a letter from Taiwan uh, announcing that she will not seek re-election nor if nominated, be nominated or if elected serve as the next presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church in America. Now, much of our audience is like, yeah, finally, you know, and you, you know, and Kevin, yeah? this really reminds me of another figure from our recent past. <sighs> Let me play the clip. I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Now, this is interesting because we can juxtapose Lyndon Johnson, um, who had to not seek re-election because of what war? Uh, Vietnam. Vietnam. Um, now, the Vietnam. Vietnam. Yes. The juxtaposition with Catherine Jefferson Shorey is Lyndon Johnson was fighting the commies, and Catherine Shorey was a commie. So there's there's Absolutely. lots of <laughs> there's lots of things we can do here. Now. You know, Catherine Jefford Shorey was a boon to Anglican TV. We started uh, about about six or seven months after she was elected, and um, Anglican TV just took off there. We had uh, Anglican Report with Bill Witt. I would travel around the world uh, to primates meetings where she was scolded for doing what she did, and the Episcopal Church was falling apart, and the formation, the ACNA. Um, the term of Catherine Jefford Shorey as presiding bishop has been a boon for Anglican TV, but also the ACNA, George. Yeah, she really should be a secret shareholder and get, <laughs> get some sort of return on her investment in she us. She should, yes. Catherine Jeffrey, God, God has used Catherine Jeffrey Shorey in remarkable ways. Mm -hmm. 
Um, sometimes I want, you know, I wonder what is going on in the Episcopal Church. What is happening? What are we? What should I try to discern from all that is taking place? Why did he raise up this person to be the leader at this time? Well, in her letter announcing her resignation, uh, I'm sorry, announcing that she would not seek a second term of office, she stated that her purposes had to had been to make the doctrines and teachings of the Episcopal Church clear and to broaden its demographic base to include people not normally considered Episcopalian. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, she broke the Frank Griswold tradition of Jell-O. Absolutely, because Frank Griswold could give you a 45-minute sermon, and you agreed with it, but you didn't know why. He could teach, and you would say, yeah, I think. Uh, wait, uh, uh, what did he say? But Catherine Jeffers Shorey, you know what she says, and she says what she means and means what she does. Um, and it's really hard to find out what she's going to go down in history with. Sure, she was the presiding bishop who deposed more people than any presiding bishop in history. Yeah, but she also was the one who said, we're, not, we're going to be transparent, and what we do here at the Episcopal Church is finally uh, be active in what we believe, or what the 815 believes. And I think that's really been uh, coherent in the last uh, seven, eight years, George. I mean, we start, you know, I started off my, when I was first ordained, we had a presiding bishop whose mantra was there were no outcasts. Mm -hmm. Everybody is welcome at the Episcopal Church. And that was taken up further by his successor, Frank Griswold. And Frank Griswold wanted to have a church where Gene Robinson could be a bishop and succeed in his ministry and a church where Keith Ackerman and Jack Eicher could succeed in their ministries. And Catherine Jefferson Shore has had no interest in that. She has made it quite clear that there are outcasts and they are the people who do not share her beliefs. And those people have formed the Anglican Church in North America, many of them. Others have retreated into redoubts in the Alps like Central Florida or Albany or Dallas, places where they're safe for the time being from the advancing armies of the Huns. But we have clarity whereas we didn't before. We've gone through a period where the Episcopal Church is being refined, it's being held up, it's losing money, it's hemorrhaging members, it is going through a doctrinal freefall. We've got people proposing things without any theological justification or any consideration of the Bible, yet it is forcing us to look at ourselves and say, how does God want us to act in these times? And that is a good thing. Just as God raised up Nebuchadnezzar to chastise the Hebrew children, so God has raised up Catherine Jeffrey Chory to chastise the Episcopal children. I'm getting a headache thinking of all, all the uh, <laughs> coincidences here. Now, a another thing we need to look at is Catherine Jeffrey Chory versus the Anglican Communion. Um, the, w it didn't take too long to figure out how broken the Episcopal Church was in dealing with Catherine Jefford Shorey. Um, she paid no attention to general convention. Uh, she saw no budget she couldn't break, no rule, no rule that uh, would not uh, uh, come asunder under her feet. In, in the same way, uh, the Anglican Communion has lost you know, its focus in how to deal with churches like uh, the, the Episcopal Church. Um, it found out that we have no accountability, just as the Episcopal Church has no accountability. And this has really led to uh, you know, what we call the tearing of the fabric of the Anglican Communion. Uh, you didn't really, you know, sure it was Frank Griswold who uh, consecrated Gene Robinson, but I don't think the actual tearing of the fabric came about until Catherine Jefford Shorey uh, you know, signed these agreements and, and lied to the primates. And, um, Rowan was not able to to bring things back together after uh, um, Dar es Salaam, George. Well, let's contrast two different presiding bishops. Now, let me say at the outset, I approve of neither one's course of action. Okay. Frank Griswold went to the emergency primates meeting in 2003, which I attended back, what we call in, in the journalism, backstopping, meaning I stood against the bo a door waiting, <laughs> trying to hear what was going on. Frank Griswold was asked by the primates not to go ahead with the consecration of Gene Robinson. And the primates put together a document asking the Episcopal Church not to proceed because it was te would tear the fabric of the communion. Frank Griswold signed that statement in his capacity as presiding bishop. But he also told the primates at that meeting as though he may have his own personal views and may sign things on his own personal behalf, he could not commit the Episcopal Church by any document that he signed at such a meeting. Mm -hmm. And so he went home, 
consecrated Gene Robinson, but there was, and people were, were furious because he had signed a document saying you shouldn't, but then went ahead and did it. But from the very outset, Frank was able to wear two hats, speak with two faces, if you will, and say, personally, I may be this way, but institutionally, I'm that way. Now, look, let's go to Dara Salam. Catherine Jeffrey Shorey signs the document saying the Episcopal Church must repent and turn around and do all these things. She was there. Let's, I mean, Drexel Gomez told me she signed it. I mean, I can go through the list of all the primates who told me absolutely that she signed it. She leaves the meeting and then she tells the people in the United States she didn't sign it. And Drexel Gomez tells me that she's a liar. Mm -hmm. We've got two different structures here of how to, how to do things. One is the ideological purity structure that the cause must prevail no matter what versus the institutional structure, which is the institution must prevail no matter what. So now we come up to what will life be like without Catherine Jefford Shorey as presiding bishop? I mean, that's what's going to happen next year. And we have to look at it this way. As, as far as Anglican TV, yeah, she made it. She made us. Um, she, you know, she needs, deserves to be on the board. Um, without us being able to shine the light on her darkness, I don't think Anglican TV would exist. We, we you know, we, it was hard to exist under Frank Griswold, um, but she made it easy. However, we have to look at it in terms of like the ACNA. Um, the person who replaces uh, Presiding Jeffrey Shorey, uh, if he or she is more moderate, may be uh, forced uh, by the Anglican Archbishop of Canterbury to work with the ACNA or vice versa. Um, he would never force this upon the ACNA with her office, but her replacement, whether it be a moderate or uh, uh, maybe a, a liberal, could not possibly be as bad as her, George. Well, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can open. name half a dozen people who are worse, uh, yeah. could be worse, who members of the House of Bishops sure. from an ideological purity perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, Kevin, one of the things we need to remember is the word that's come out of Lambeth for a number of years, and no, it's not been an official statement, and no, I can't swear to you that, you know, Justin Welby told me this in confidence. Rather, what people have told me who are involved in the higher echelons of the Church of England and Lambeth Palace is that the view from London is we have to wait for both Bob Duncan and Catherine Jeffrey Shorey to pass from the scene before we can have any meaningful steps towards reconciliation or fixing the problem. In their view, this has become so personalized. Bob Duncan is hated by some people in the Episcopal Church. Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, as we have amply demonstrated, is vilified <laughs> by others. Now, both are kind, honorable, decent people who I believe believe what they believe with integrity. So it is wrong for me to to make fun of someone at, an, at their expense. And for that, I, I do plead guilty. But we could get someone, we could get someone like Gene Sutton, the mm -hmm. current Bishop of Maryland. Bishop Sutton is a liberal. He believes in all the causes uh, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey supports. But at the same time, he has welcomed the Anglican Church of Kenya into Baltimore City, allowed them to set up congregations for expatriate Kenyans, and is willing to work with, if you will, two polities, two understandings. He is not a purist in the way that Catherine Jeffrey Shore is a purist. Someone like that as a presiding bishop who wants to go back to the no outcasts way will basically make, that will end any thought of further defections of dioceses. And that he'll be allow he will allow us in Central Florida or the people in Dallas or Albany and other places to go on being who we are, remain faithful to our understanding of the gospel and the church's traditions. It would be a return to nod, nod, wink, wink. You know, or then we could get someone like Ian Douglas, oof. who's a brilliant man, yes. is the smoothest politician you'll ever see, and can wrap any Archbishop of Canterbury around his finger. Mm -hmm. He too will continue the policies of the presiding bishop, but he will do it in such a way that you won't note it that your pocket's being picked. <laughs> now, I, I know Ian, I believe him to be a man of integrity who believes what he believes, but again, he would be someone who would be very successful as presiding bishop. And then there are presiding, then there are candidates, and I don't wish to name people in a negative fashion, who would just 
sort of be blundering cartoonish clowns caricatures of sort of the uh the church of what's happening now i know who you're thinking of you're right we shouldn't name names now nobody here we named are we endorsing in any way we're just saying that <clears throat> we need to look down what will the church be like without Catherine jeff Troy. and uh you know it's interesting because i have to i look at it as a ministry perspective and we have to look at it as a church perspective george and i pray for the day that there's unity once again in the anglican communion we pray for the day when the Episcopal Church will repent and come back into the fold of the Anglican Communion. Kevin, I, th I think our viewers need to understand it in this. Th this is how my brain works, and this, okay. this is why I've, uh, I, <laughs> yes. I am who I am. The Episcopal Church is faced with uh, Lenin has died. Yes. Do we bring in a Stalin <laughs> to make things much worse? Mm -hmm. Do we bring up a Brezhnev, somebody who's corrupt and will go along and milk the system until the last dollar is spent of the trust funds? Or do we bring in a Gorbachev who really wants to find a way out of this free fall and is at the end of the day willing to sacrifice the liberal platitudes and turn the church around? And if they're not so let's careful, they get stuck pray with the, that yeah. Gorbachev is elected presiding bishop, not Stalin. Uh, and hope that they don't get stuck with the Yeltsin. So I, I know what you're saying. Um, and, you know, those are the realities we have to live on the ground. So that's the breaking news. How much time? We, we've gone 15 minutes already. So we're going to leave you with that. Um, our call to our viewers is to pray about this. The Episcopal Church is going to lose. Now, you said Lenin. I was thinking John Lennon, but uh, they're, going to lose, they're losing their Lenin. And we need to, to pray about who's going to be the next leader of the Episcopal Church. Uh, not because this is important to George and I. This is important to God. You know, we are asking uh, our Father in Heaven to take control again of the church. And he's had, from time to time again, from we read in Scripture, um, had to, you know, oh my gosh, what have you guys done with this place? Uh, come back and, and fix things, and we're asking for that now. Kevin, mm -hmm. there's light at the end of the tunnel. Our long national nightmare may be over soon. Look at you, my pretty, and your little dog, too.